this possibility in the beginning. Prince, Prince, make sure you're a human, not a bot like those roaches that come into our live stream. Get, get, get the f with the program. That insect is getting my f nerves at 3 a.m. Pressed, 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 pressed. Everything will be cured here. I'm gonna slap your sorry for this camera. It's a camera, not a human. Push. <laughs> On your incredibly ugly face. Measuring your face with chopstick. Assuming all of your Asian perfectly symmetric like an Apple product of photo. Checking your faults. We have to stay quiet for a while. You are perfectly ugly in this ratio. Get the f the program. Perfectly measuring your face. Check your ears. Centimeters. This side is sharp. Actually, both sides are sharp. But so, <laughs> both are dull. So, <laughs> dull. Sharp. <laughs> dull. Sharp and dull. No, I'm kidding. Go. Can you hear it now? Flutter. Yeah, that means your pop out your cheeks for me. <laughs> like somebody just came in your mouth. Let's go. Looks like I'm trying to be cute. Focus on my fingers thoroughly, like your mom last night. Let's go. Let's go. Relax. Too much earwax. Just relax. Carefully keep following my fingers. Follow my fingers. Follow my fingers. Keep looking in the distance. Let's go. Follow the light. Follow the light. Follow the light. Brush. Brush. Let's go. Testing your body's reflexes. Okay. You, need, you, need, you, need. you can try to twist your body like this. Touch my finger. And touch your nose. Finger. Nose. Finger. Could you turn your chin against my hand like this? Resist to turn your chin against my slapping your face. 64 from 26. 40, 71. You did a great job today. Thank you.
Assalamu alaikum. Gently press 
pressing your face. Press. 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 Can you feel my fingers? That's what she's saying. Press. 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 Yes, focus on my fingers. Press. 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 I'm gonna just test your face sensors. Sensors. I'm gonna test your face senses like this. Press. Feel your temperature. I wanna feel your face's temperature and make sure you're a human and not a bot like those roaches that come into our live streams. <laughs> press, 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 gently pressed, pressed. Your face is being pressed. before everything starts. Relax. You need to relax. Relax. Your face. Your face seems okay. It's too hot. Sorry for this camera. It's a camera, not a human. Push. <laughs> Thanks. 
your face. Get the f with the program. Let's go. Checking your pulse on your wrist. This isn't your face, this is your wrist. Get the f the poop. Wrist. Checking your pulse. Checking your pulse. Checking your pulse. We have to stay quiet. Check your face. Checking if it's symmetric. Symmetric. We need a little tool. I'm gonna use a chopstick first. Assuming all of your Asian. Measuring your face with chopstick. Measuring your face. Checking if it's symmetric. Perfectly symmetric. Like an Apple product photo. Perfectly satisfying. Symmetric. Checking. Checking. Checking your face. Checking your face's ratio. Checking your face's ratio. You are perfectly ugly in this ratio okay measuring 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 your measuring your face measuring your face's ratio perfectly perfectly measuring Like that. 
and tell me correctly you have to be serious okay get the f with the room. that was dull 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 okay this side on your eye area
voice seems okay. One sec, one, one more, one more session. Sharp. Tall.
now. Okay, this side. Let's go. away from you tell me when you can't hear it or hear it anymore let's go now okay one more time for following along so well, okay? So, I'm gonna once again test your face uh, with this fire. And just tell me when you can feel the burn, okay? I'm kidding, of course. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wiggle my fingers. I'm gonna wiggle my fingers here, <laughs> further from you again, and then I need you to look straight at me. Look straight at me, even though we all know you're gay. Happy Pride. Is it over? Um, I want you to look straight at me. And I'm gonna wiggle my fingers. So I'm gonna do these air quotes. I want you to tell me when you can't see my fingers wiggling anymore, okay? And when you can't see them anymore, just know that these are inside your mom. <laughs> Let's go. Tell me when you can't see it anymore. Now, once again, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start from here and then go up here. Okay, I'm gonna go further. Okay, actually, the space is large, and that's the benefit of having this kind of large space. You know. Okay, I'm gonna start from here. Tell me when you can't see it anymore. Let's go. It looks like I'm trying to be cute. Now. Tell me when you can't see my fingers anymore. Let's go. Now, okay. Further, even further. How about now? Okay. Checking your eyesight and overall your vision thoroughly. Tell me when you can't see my fingers anymore. Just look straight at me. Look straight at me. Focus on my fingers. Focus on my fingers thoroughly, like your mom last night. Let's go. Tell me when you can't see it anymore. Okay, you can't see. <laughs> Let's go. You can't see them anymore. Okay, thank you. One more time. Let's go. Thank you, you're doing a very great job. Now. I'm gonna use this fancy tool, this actual medical tool, to inspect your ears carefully. Okay. Let's start with this tool. And just feel the sounds first. I'm gonna put this cover on first to prevent your dirty, funky ear wax from sticking to this high quality equipment.
nothing. The size seems fine. Relax. straight into the distance. This side. seems normal. Okay. Did you feel anything? No? Just your mom? Okay. Follow my fingers. Keep following my fingers. Follow my fingers. Keep following my fingers. Okay, you're doing a very good job. I'm gonna start further. Follow my fingers. From here, keep following my fingers. Keep following my fingers. All the way back. All the way back. Okay. Right there. Follow my fingers. Follow my fingers. fingers now I'm gonna take a look into your mouth with this tool again and literally my popsicle stick <laughs> let's go, uh, take your tongue out uh, then I'm gonna test your gas reflex take your tongue out uh, let's go Throat. Throat. Uh, take your tongue out. Uh, this is your throat. Uh, deeper. 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 Take your tongue. Check him. 
massage your lymph nodes right here. Your lymph nodes right here. This is important for singing as well. very important step for your swallowing ability. <laughs> Left, right. I'm gonna cover your eyes like this. I'm gonna cover your eyes like this. And you follow my fingers, okay? Cover your one eye. Don't focus on my beautiful face. Okay. Follow my fingers.
drink circles. <sighs> Everything seems normal. You're doing very great. Okay. Follow the light. Follow the light. Follow the light. Keep looking in the distance. Follow the light. Follow the light. Follow the light. All the way close to your eyes. Follow the light. The other side. Follow the light. Follow the light. Follow the light. Damn, it's hot. your face just for fun brush 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 Senses overall. Checking if you're sensitive. Gently brushing and eating. Checking your face's senses. Bob Ross. your body's reflexes with these two hammers. One is very, one is rubber and one is very hard. So try to resist, try to resist like the previous step, okay? Let's go. reflexes.
try to twist your butt like this. Okay. Doing very great. And try to lean. Like this. Try to lean. Oh. Oh, did you know that? This is my favorite body trigger these days. It's getting very hot. And I shouldn't be filming in this environment, actually. I want you to touch my finger, and then touch your nose. Touch my finger, and touch your nose. Touch my finger, touch your nose. Okay. Touch my finger. Touch your nose. Touch my finger. Touch your nose. Touch my finger. Touch your nose. Touch my finger. Nose. Finger. Finger. You do it. Finger. Finger. Nose. Finger. Nose. Finger. Finger. Nose. Finger. Nose. Finger. Nose. 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 you turn your chin against my hand like this resist turn it turn it turn it okay the other side turn it <coughs> turn your chin against my slapping your face <laughs> now what days okay what days are in a week Tell me, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, okay, Saturday, okay. Well, what's your wife's name? Your wife? Yes, because you're gay. Your wife's name? You don't have a wife? I'll make sure to tell her. Uh, try to cough. <coughs> try to cough. <coughs> try to sneeze. <coughs> gotcha. Try to sneeze. <coughs> try to sneeze. And roaches try to f off. Okay. okay, could you shrug your shoulders for me? Shrug your shoulders. Shrug your shoulders. Twist your body again. Crack your necks. Oh. Feels good. Now, finally, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see numbers into your ears and tell me which numbers. I just said into your ears, okay? Let's go. I f***ed your mom last night. <laughs> no, I was kidding.
Lagos and Derrida are very important in a sense that they open the way for us to view the world in a non, uh, non-linear way, to say, a non-fixed, non-absolute way. For example, uh, the, the, the words like, words like the world or God or the, my, my country, the humanity, all are fixed concepts. Be at Deleuze and Derrida in the 20th century, we have actually found a way to shift our attention toward the uh, uh, multiple slay and the uh, more dynamic side of our of our reality. The two pillars of deconstruction. Both Derrida and Deleuze uh, cite Hegel's conception of difference, specifically in the form of the Auf, Aufhebung. Is anybody from Germany? Aufhebung means uh, elevation from the negative state to the higher positive states. Aufhebung as the background against which their own concepts of difference are formulated. Deleuze is basically anti-Hegel, anti-Hegelianism. Can be difficult to execute. Hegel is surreptitiously woven into his system every conceivable possibility of antithesis and opposition. So there is a saying you cannot basically oppose Hegel because Hegel has thought of every possibility uh, for anyone to, of every possibility of anyone going against him. So uh, Hegel is special in the history of philosophy uh, in a sense that. He basically came up with the non-refutable, non-refutable vast universe of system. So the, 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 the issue here is that if Deleuze and Derrida are so innovative, if, if they're truly innovative enough as far as they could actually overcome Hegel, if, if Hegel is that famous for not allowing anyone to go against him, uh, uh, uh. So to truly escape ego involves an exact, exact appreciation of the price we have to pay to detach ourselves from him. He stands motionless, waiting for us. So he's like a ghost, a specter at the end of the alley. Uh, you cannot go against him ever. You can never overcome ego because his, because his whole system is based on overcoming any kind of negative, going against each other. Each rejects specific aspects of Hegelian difference. Difference is for Derrida is understood as a negativity so negative that it forever eludes the traditional Hegelian understanding of the negative. Difference in French, like um, difference with an e, d i f f e r e n s. It says the same spelling as the English difference, but. Difference and difference in English are different. So Deleuze and Derrida, two uh, 20th century innovative philosophers, are both famous for paying attention to difference, not identity, or being uh, in a way that we, we are all different, right? We are all different. It can be applied to basically anything. Like we are all different. For example, like LGBT people who are or black li- the Black Lives Matter movement. Those kind of progressive, so-called progressive movements are based on how all the, each individual is different, not catchable under one framework. So this is already the zeitgeist of our time. In this age, we're all trying to realize our differences. That's basically what difference means, nothing other than the difference we experience in this age. But Deleuze's difference and Derrida's difference are kind of vastly different, oddly vastly different, will be the point of this chapter here in a way that Deleuze's difference, uh, to spoil everything, Deleuze's difference is positive, whereas Derrida's difference, or with an A, difference in French, is something more negative than negativity. If you can grasp what it is, it's a very amusing concept that's not an easily digestible concept for everybody. It's really not a concept. If it's a concept, but it's not a concept at the same time, so what the f*** is, right? So that's the confusion. Derrida here is it on purpose trying to get at because we are so trapped with concept, conceptuality and framework-based thinking. Derrida and Deleuze both are trying to make us break out of this whole tradition. They are philosophers, but they are also non-philosophers.
philosophers, self-claimed non-philosophers. That's the fun part. Derrida repeatedly casts his project explicitly and in practice as an extended engagement with Hegel's thought. Okay, you have to know, you have to know Hegel before you can understand, you can truly understand Derrida, but it can obviously happen at the same time because Derrida's whole non-system is based on Hegel's system. He's trying to overcome his system, system, systematicality itself at the root. Hegel did a very good job of engraving his, his, his vast system of uh, encompassing all dynamicity, all dynamicities of everything into his system. And Derrida is trying to basically emancipate us from that system. Derrida's defongs, once again, you have to differentiate. Derrida's defongs and Deleuze's difference. Those two words actually sound the same. Sound the exact same in French. The same word can be different. The same word can uh, uh, be re revaried in a way via writing before speaking. Derrida is a philosopher of writing before speaking. That will get clear as we as we could as we delve deeper. Despite maintaining relations of profound affinity with Hegelian discourse, such that it is up to a certain point unable to break with the discourse, the task of Diffelong's is to operate a kind of infinitesimal and radical displacement of it. There is trying to continue Hegel, but at the same time is trying to break with Hegel. This was important. Hegel is like a parasite in Derrida's non-system. I keep saying non-system because it's very important to understand Derrida as, a, as, as an uh, insufficient system. The ultimate reality for Derrida is not something that can be grasped via a system. Whereas in Ego, everything is encompassed, everything is grasped via his system. As John Pertevi writes, his confrontation with Hegel is instructive. Therefore, we must investigate what Derrida understands to be essential to Hegel's discourse. Why, for Derrida, a radical break from Hegel in any form of anti hegelian philosophy is impossible. It's very interesting. He's trying to do the radical break, but at the same time, he's telling everybody that we cannot make a radical break from Hegel in any form. Everything's you may notice that everything's just uh, every everything's like contradictory from the beginning. So you basically he's trying to overcome something while telling everybody that we cannot overcome. It is here that we see the central role that Hegel plays for Derrida's thinking as the thinker who consummates the philosophical tradition. Hegel completes Hegel perfects the philosophical tradition for Derrida and uh, for Derrida, it is really not enough. Derrida never abandons, even in the later, more mature phases of his career. Hegel is very important, as you've seen so far. What kind of relationship with Hegel uh, did Derrida actually have in the beginning? Michel Foucault appears here as the preliminary, preliminary important figure for Derrida's battle with Hegel in his groundbreaking first work, Bully et de raison, folie et de raison, histoire de la folie de l'âge classique, claims that the task of his work is to write the history of madness, to reconstitute the experience of madness, to draw up the archaeology of the silence. Silence here refers to madness, madness as opposed to reason. We all try to cope everything with reason, okay? If you're mad, then everything starts falling apart. Without reason, life in this age cannot work. We are all forced to work based on reason. And madness is literally the part where we have to kick to the curb for us to function in this world. We are too brainwashed by reason to pay attention to madness. But madness is where our or where our true origin is for Foucault. For reason, madness is the other, the negated other, and madness to uh, to madness reason is the negated other. But madness doesn't really negate anything because at the root, uh, because that's that's what madness is. But madness.
madness is basically something chaotic. In essence, there's no negation in madness. Everything's mixed up. Everything is chaos. Whereas in reason, without negation, reason cannot, reason cannot stand it to begin with. So that's why negation is uh, something that's very fundamental for fundamental for reason. Without not this, not that, you cannot you cannot affirm anything. Obama is not Trump. Chocolate is not vegetable. To make a judgment, you have to negate in the beginning. Proclaiming itself the sole leg legitimate bearer of meaning and of truth, reason sees itself as qualified and obliged to in turn study, manipulate, and manage madness. As a result of being spoken only through the language of reason, madness has been prohibited from giving voice by the work of negation. What reason has established uh, themselves is that I'm over you. I'm something superior to you. Madness. Madness has been prohibited from giving voice to its own experience from the depths of that experience itself. So madness, since it's something very chaotic, it has a very deep and diverse experience than reason. Because madness uh, comes from a myriad of sense experiences, whereas reason is based on clear judgments. Madness from the root to from the beginning has a lot of depth, whereas reason is trying to control and reduce that depth into something that fits its system. These criticisms are revelatory in understanding Darius' relation to what he considers to be the legacy and significance of Hegelianism. Once again, Foucault is the first trier, first attempter of overcoming Hegel. Darius remains suspicious of that. Because Foucault determines the founding psychiatric reason as historically contemporaneous with the Cartesian moment, the language of psychiatry is simul simultaneously the Cartesian language of self certainty and the foundation of modern philosophy, the very language of structure and order. You can be sure of your existence via thinking. Psychiatry is continuing that tradition of I am because I'm. Because I think. I am proven to be because I think. Foucault rejects that because in that moment of cogito, basically something was excluded, something crucial, some something that was essentially crucial was rejected and excluded with that birth of modernity with the course. And insofar as history or archaeology will require the use of language, we are trapped in the system of language because language itself, in our age, pervaded by the Western thought, is ruled by reason and its system. So, Foucault notices that, but in Derrida's view, is not reflecting on that enough. Uh, one may ignore the silence, thus preventing its contamination by the language of his captor, or one may become silent, but writing a history of the silence is impossible, Derrida claims. Because you want, if you want to write a history, then you have to use language, and without language, Without language, you cannot record. But if you if you want to escape language, then you have to remain silent, so you're not saying anything. So that's at the root, fundamentally contradictory. The perception that aims to apprehend them in their wildest state, the madness, the madness in their most chaotic, rawest state necessarily belongs to a world that has captured them already. So once you, at the very moment, you try to escape the mesh of reason, the matrix of reason and language, you are trapped back by them again. Madness itself, the silence of reason, lacks the language to articulate its imprisonment. Madness doesn't have any language, so it's destined to be trapped in language. So it cannot win reason ever. Madness cannot win reason ever. So where is the way out, right? Madness is the absence of an oeuvre. You cannot truly save madness because madness cannot use language. <laughs> I feel like a broken record. The investigator thus faces a paradox. Oh yeah. She seeks to give voice to the unique experience of madness in its wild and primitive state. But both the real 
realization of this need as well as the tools by which the vocalization will be conducted are the property of the very reason that has exercised and excluded it. Reason is like the priest. Reason is the exorcist and man is like the ghost. One should try to uh, save madness from reason. You are falling back in reason. You cannot escape reason ever. That is our fate is what these people are saying here okay the language of Foucault's archaeology must therefore be neither the wild silence of the man nor the determined form of classical reason but rather the language of their deci decisive collisions the wild silence of the mad that is essentially contradictory because silence doesn't speak silence doesn't speak while the reason cannot shut up the language of their decisive collision. The otherness of madness has not yet attained its polarity at the level of the primordial reason, the originary reason at the beginning of humanity. There is no distinction of reason versus madness. Right? That's what Foucault is saying. Foucault is trying to achieve here. But, once again, without otherness, can madness even be revealed as unveiled as madness without reason in the first place a reason more profound than the reason which issued forth during the classical age how do you know if such reason is reason right you are using you are literally using the classical reason to grasp the so-called primordial reason a language more original much rougher and much more matutinal than that of science. So the reason before science, the classical reason, is the reason that birthed in science with Descartes and his act of cogito, his whole reflection of, I think therefore I am. But there's somehow a reason more primordial and more originary than such science birthing reason, the reason we're all familiar with in this age. However much Derrida might appreciate the necessity of Foucault's project of giving voice to unreason. Derrida appreciates this project, the whole ambition to grasp, silence the primordial unreason, the primordial madness before reason's dictatorship. But it is a necessity that can only ever be paradoxical, because madness cannot be stated if it is stated that then that's not madness. Through the very movement by which he sought escape, Foucault repeats Hegel, thereby falls prey to the totalizing trap he has so carefully set. It's very interesting. In this early engagement of Emmanuel Levinas, Derrida addresses many themes and questions similar to those in the Cogito piece. The relation of reason to unreason, of philosophy to non-philosophy, and of self to other. Levinas is famous for ethics, trying to attune ontology to ethics, not the other way around. But Heidegger is the other way around. Heidegger for Heidegger. Heidegger doesn't give a f about ethics. But Levinas is basically trying to go the opposite way to Heidegger. It may even be that these questions are not philosophical, are not philosophy's questions. Nevertheless, these should be the only questions that they capable of founding the community within the world of those who are still called philosophers. So philosophers today, they tend to be very ethical, very ethics-based, because all the traditional metaphysics, the, the, the whole discourse is about God and the transcendental realm. They are all proven to be bullshit, according to th this line of philosophers. It's essentially nihilistic. But uh, even Christianity is nihilistic, too. So uh, the problem of nihilism has never been fixed in this age. Uh, I mean, I have the answer, but <laughs> Levinas, anyway, these questions are thus, are of the so-called death of philosophy. So, in the beginning of the 20th century, the last century, Nietzsche, Nietzsche and others claimed the death of God. But surely, 
shortly after following that philosophy itself was dead following the death of God because the whole system of philosophy was based on God's existence so if God is dead philosophy has to be dead necessarily the relation of the western philosophical tradition to its own undoing or demise and the way in which this demise is constitutive of and essential to the history of western philosophy itself the phenomenological tradition of Husserl, Heidegger and Levinas is relevant to this inquiry thanks to its ever renewed search for a rigorous foundation of philosophy itself they are trying to save and re refoundationalize philosophy refound and find a new beginning find a new basis for philosophy as a whole system the paradoxical necessity that marked the Kogito essay is here made explicit and will establish itself as the hallmark of deconstruction. I think, therefore, I am, highs, essentially, hiles and veils something in the background by claiming that, oh, something is sure. My, my existence is certain. By claiming that you are necessarily hiding and veiling something. That's been the destiny of modern philosophy. Levinas characterizes totality and infinity as a work of metaphysics, but in a precise sense, emphasizing the notion of transcendence embedded within the Greek prefix meta, as in metaphysics, right? It is turned toward the elsewhere and the otherwise and the other. So metaphysics is essentially based on a neglecting and excluding the other. Contrary to Husserl and Heidegger, Levinas will not bend to the demands of an inherited inherited tradition, instead calling for a dislocation of the Greek logos of something primordial and something fundamental. For Levinas, that kind of Heideggerian treasure should be precisely something we have to abandon to go forward. A dislocation of our identity and perhaps of identity, the concept of identity in general. We keep saying that identity politics is an issue. Identity politics is the problem, but it's very odd that the, the, the whole progressive movements of this age is based on discovering difference, discovering individual differences within us. But the whole movement goes back, returns to word, the established, the, the, the enforcement of identities. Levinas here is calling for the abolishment of identity, the, the concept of identity in general. So without, without the concept of identity, we can still prosper as pure differences. Levinas will counterpose what he considers to be the other foundation voice of the West, the Hebraic. So Levinas is Jew. And for him, the whole Greek thought and the whole Greek traditional thought that began with Socrates and Plato is basically a heresy of humanity and basically a treason to the originary thought. It's very odd that he goes back to this kind of identity-based thinking. But this is not to establish a theological foundation, not to say... We need to believe in God. We need to go back to the, the Old Testament God, God of the Israel. This is to simply to open the inheritance of the Greek tradition to the thought of radical alterity, something that started with original Greek thinkers before Plato, before Aristotle, before Socrates, offered by Judaic religion in the concept of creation. It's very odd. The, the Greek tradition of philosophy and the Hebraic, the Judaic tradition of religion or Judaism of belief, the Christianity, they seem to be on the surface, the vastly different lines of thought. But Levinas here is discovering the essence of Greek thought is actually unveiled best in the Judaic religion centered on the concept of creation of God. The great force of the idea of creation such as it was contributed by monotheism is that this creation is actually
text me hello from nothingness creation came from nothingness so god created something out of nothing greek philosophy and its successors bound by parmenidian monism are incapable of thinking the ex nihilo nothing truly new is possible for greek thinkers including Par parmenides nothing truly new is possible but for the Judaic religion, that's what's the most unique about the Judaic religion, at least for Levinas, because anything that comes to be would have already been contained as an element of necessity within the totalizing force of being. So for Greek philosophers, being is already there. Being precedes everything, so there's nothing truly new. Whereas in the Judaic religion, in the Old Testament, God created something out of nothing. But it's essentially contradictory if you think about it, because God created something out of nothing, so there was nothing before God, but God was something. So God has to exist before anything exists, so is God existence or not? <laughs> Does God exist or not, right, according to the Judaic belief? Because if God created something out of nothing, then God shouldn't be anything, so God doesn't exist basically so god is something or someone that is never graspable via the greek framework of being uh, that's why levinas is telling everybody to go back to the judaic religion not not believing it but going back to his uh, primordial reflection of pre-being nothing truly new is possible because anything that comes to be would have already been element of necessity within the totalizing force of being. The radicality of the thought of creation ex nihilo is that the creator remains remains absolutely distinct from creation, thus opening thought toward the pluralism that does not merge into unity. This is very interesting because uh, people think Christianity, Christianity or Judaism are mostly about the thought of identity, the framework of identity. God is there, that we have to be one. We have to be one community of brothers and sisters, whatever, God's children, whatever. But in essence, according to Levinas' view, Judaism or Christianity, based on the creator God, is focused on the pluralism, the polar opposite to people's perception or even Christians' perception of their own religion toward the pluralism that does not merge into unity, the absolute gap of separation which transcendence implies, cannot be better expressed than by the term creation, creation from nothingness, in which the kinship of beings among themselves is affirmed, but at the same time their radical heterogeneity also, their reciprocal exteriority coming from nothingness, you are not me. And this tree is not this tree. We are all external to each other. We are all others to each other. So when Jesus said in the gospel, when Jesus said in the New Testament Bible, love each other, that can be actually interpreted as stating the impossibility of love. We cannot love each other truly because we are all different. We are all radically different. Radical heterogeneity. The metaphysical desire constitutive of the self for Levinas is the desire for transcendence, to escape the self with no longing for return. This will be made possible in the ethical relationship, a non-violent relationship to the infinite as infinitely other to the other, as the only one capable of opening the space of transcendence and of liberating metaphysics. Right? We, we all seek to go beyond our self. If you want to do that, we have to essentially ignore the other, the other person opening the space of transcendence. He's, he's talking here about God liberating metaphysics. There has to be the absolute other that guarantees our transcendence's possibility in the beginning for us to be transcendent. To begin with, in the thought of the other, Greek monism is breached, executing the parasite of Parmenides. Greek monism of being, right? Everything's one. Everything's one. That thought is breached, executing the parasite.